Today on People Now, the latest after Glee star Naya Rivera was reported missing. The battle for the name Lady A continues with the country band now filing a lawsuit against the blues singer Lady A. We'll tell you what they say she's asking for. Mariah Carey opens up about what fans will learn in her new memoir. Plus, he's being modest, but he's ridiculously good. David Schwimmer tells us how Nick Muhammad's magic was a huge hit with Schwimmer's daughter. Also today, it's amazing. Hightown star Monica Raymond tells us about the most fun job in the world working on the star's hit crime drama. All that and more today on People Now. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome to People Now. Hope you're having a good Thursday so far. I'm Andrea Belke. How's it going, Jeremy? It's going pretty well. There's so much to get to today. A very busy show. Here's what you need to know and watch trending. Beginning on a sad note, Glee star Naya Rivera has been missing since Wednesday after her four-year-old son was found alone in a boat on a California lake. A tweet from the Ventura County Sheriff early Thursday morning detailed their plans to resume the search for Rivera, saying that the lake will be closed to the public and dive teams throughout the region will be brought in to assist. Meanwhile, Rivera's friends and co-stars in Hollywood are speaking out amid her disappearance. Actress Victoria Justice tweeted out, praying for Naya. That's a tweet that multiple celebrities, including Harry Shum Jr., mimicked on their pages. Heather Morris, who starred alongside Rivera in Glee as her character's friend and later her wife, posted on her Instagram story, quote, we need all the prayers we can get to bring our Naya back home to us. We need your love and light. Former Glee star Iqbal Taba posted an emotional plea on Twitter saying in part, Oh God, mercy, please. And Demi Lovato, who guest starred on Glee as Rivera's love interest, posted a lit candle to her Instagram story with the caption, please pray for Naya Rivera to be found safe and sound. On Wednesday, Rivera was reported missing after a trip to Lake Piru in Ventura County, California. The actress and her four-year-old son, Josie, rented a pontoon boat and were swimming in the water. The boat was overdue for its return after the three-hour rental when staff at the lake found it at the north side of the lake with her son aboard asleep. Rivera was not with him. A search and rescue operation began at the lake on Wednesday, but she was not found. The day before she went missing, Rivera shared a photo of herself and her son on Instagram, captioning it, just the two of us. And in a post that is now full of meaning, on July 2nd, she took to Instagram to remind her fans this, quote, no matter the year, circumstance, or strifes, every day you're alive is a blessing. Make the most of today and every day you are given. Tomorrow is not promised. We will continue to keep you updated as more news comes in. All right, switching gears now, the country band formerly known as Lady Antebellum, which changed its name to Lady A in June, has filed a lawsuit against Seattle-based blues artist Anita White, who uses the name Lady A while performing. In a filing submitted on Wednesday, attorneys for the band alleged that White's new legal counsel is asking for an exorbitant amount of money after the two parties discussed continued coexistence under the name Lady A. Though a dollar figure was not listed in the suit, the band said in a statement that White had asked for $10 million. A rep for White and the firm listed as her legal counsel in the suit did not immediately respond to people's requests for comment. On June 11th, the band announced that they were dropping the antebellum from their name to make it more inclusive, acknowledging that the word has associations to the period of American history before the Civil War, which includes slavery. A few days later, both the band and White shared on Instagram that they had connected privately on a Zoom call. They allegedly discussed various forms of cooperation to peacefully coexist, even discussions to write a song together, and the group's counsel had prepared a draft agreement for both parties to continue to share the Lady A name. However, according to the band's attorneys, White then told Newsday she was not happy with the agreement and claimed, quote, their camp is trying to erase me. Trust is important and I no longer trust them. The band's counsel said in the filing that the group has used Lady A interchangeably with Lady Antebellum as early as 2006 and applied to register Lady A for entertainment purposes at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in 2010. According to the suit, the band later applied to register the name for musical recordings and clothing and their applications were all granted without opposition from any person or entity. According to the suit, the band is not asking for money, but seeking a court declaration that they are lawfully using the Lady A trademark and that the continual usage of the name does not infringe on any trademark rights that White may legally hold or for, quote, non-trademark use of Lady A to identify herself as a musical performer. Mariah Carey has officially finished writing her memoir titled The Meaning of Mariah Carey. A press release for the book describes it as an improbable and inspiring journey of survival and resilience that will pull back the curtain on perceptions about Carrie that are often told through the filtered lens of media. I don't know, Jeremy, it sounds really interesting. I love Mariah Carey, I love celebrity memoirs, so I'm definitely gonna be picking up a copy. 
No, 100%. I'm anxious to hear more of what she has to say from her perspective. And on Wednesday, Carrie shared a message on Instagram announcing the book's completion. In that lengthy post, she notes that it took her a lifetime to have the courage and the clarity to write it. She continued saying, though there have been countless stories about me throughout my career, a very public personal life, it's been impossible to communicate the complexities and depths of my experience in any single magazine article or 10 minute television interview. The book, which is currently available for pre-order, will include the real story about the singer's memories, mishaps, struggles, and of course, her songs. Carrie says her sincere hope is that fans are, quote, moved to a new understanding, not only about her, but also about the resilience of the human spirit. The press release adds that Carrie bravely and beautifully walks through her battles with gender and power dynamics, emotional abuse, public embarrassments, personal failures, and phenomenal victories. The book is currently available for pre-order and is set to release this September. Stay with us. Intelligence co-stars David Schwimmer and Nick Muhammad are opening up about their real life friendship. Plus, we're getting stuck in a time loop with the cast of Palm Springs. Stick around. All right, we have more from NASCAR star Bubba Wallace today. In this week's issue of People, he is opening up about his experience competing in a sport not known for its diversity. Wallace, who is the only black driver in the NASCAR Cup Series, says that dealing with racism as a young driver only motivates him to do better. At 26 years old, he now understands racism and acknowledges that it still goes on every day. But Wallace says, quote, for people to use that as something to offend me or affect me or knock me off my block, that ain't gonna happen. But it wasn't always this way. Growing up, Wallace spent all of his time competing at racetracks across the South, and he reveals that he did face some racism along the way. He tells people he never would understand it, but his parents would always just say, quote, you know what, don't mind that BS that's going on over there. Let's come back next week and beat their tails. And Wallace says that's exactly what he would do, come back to the racetrack and, quote, shut them up. He credits his parents for his decision to fight for racial equality, explaining that they were all about being fair and always pushed him to speak up about what's right and what's wrong. But as we all know, that fight for racial equality has been full of ups and downs for Wallace, like when headlines swirled that a noose was found in a garage assigned to him at the Talladega Super Speedway back in June. The FBI conducted an investigation and concluded it was not an intentional racist act. But it was still really tough for Wallace to go through that. And he reveals his longtime girlfriend and high school sweetheart, Amanda Carter, has been his backbone through all of this. For more from Bubba Wallace, pick up this week's People when it hits newsstands on Friday. This is Chris uh, Cranfield, Director of Cybersecurity at GCHQ. No way. I was expecting a guy. Will he be here long, then? Providing he plays by the rules. Watch and learn, babe. I think we can learn a lot from each other. Especially from me. Do you have an update on China? You did some pretty breathtaking work on that. This is just taken from Wikipedia. Right, you have that here? David Schwimmer and Nick Muhammad are starring in Peacock's upcoming series, Intelligence, which starts streaming July 15th. Now, the comedy follows an American NSA agent that joins forces with the UK's GCHQ. Now, the two stars open up to me on how they feel about bringing laughter through the show during the coronavirus pandemic. Watch. There's a lot of important conversations happening right now, a lot of uh, hopefully important reform. Um, obviously, everyone is still in the midst of this uh, pandemic um, and dealing with various stages of social isolation um, and, and health, like very real health concerns. Um, if we can offer up uh, a very, very brief relief from that uh, with this show, then um, that makes, I think, both of us feel real good. Yeah, Nick, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, similar. I mean, obviously, yeah, I mean, just to echo what David said, I mean, if we can offer even the tiniest sort of 20 minute respite from that, then I guess as comedians, it's a, it's a job to, to, to do. But yeah, I mean, it's not notwithstanding the fact that there are some really serious things going on in the world. Um, yeah. In some respects, our show feels a little bit frivolous, but if, if it just gives people a little bit of a break from real life, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be a good thing. Throughout the series, Nick's character tries desperately to befriend the American NSA agent David plays. Luckily though, in real life, the duo doesn't have to put that much effort in. It's been kind of a dream scenario, to be honest with you. Um, we're, we're true creative partners. It's his show, it's his baby. He came up with the characters and the idea and he's the writer, but he's so generous and so collaborative, uh, not just with me, but with our all, you know, the other producers and our wonderful director. So um, it's it's just been really kind of delightful and easy. I mean, the work we work hard, but it, I'm saying like the 
there's no friction. Everyone's interest is is to, to make the funniest and most interesting and hopefully provocative at times show. So it's been it's been kind of great. Well, I was just going to say from my point of view, it's just you know to be able to kind of you know this is my first TV series that I've written on my own, and um, to be able to lean on David's sort of wealth of experience and and the other producers as well. You know, it's just been like you know David says, it's been sort of so collaborative, but it's just been just a really fun kind of working environment. In addition to being an actor, Nick is also a magician. That's right. And I got the inside scoop on if he performed any tricks for his castmates. I think I think I probably was that guy for a, a number of years who would always go around with cards in his pocket and, and hope that someone would ask to see something. But I never I don't do it now because I sort of feel like it's a bit um I don't know, it's something there's a bit of an arrogance towards you know, the premise of a magician is I'm better than you, basically, <laughs> you know, however way you sort of bring it. So I've always tried to sort of fight against it in recent years. I mean I adore magic. I mean it's it's my you know, my first love really, and I was doing sort of magic professionally before I you sure. know, started comedy and acting. So yeah, I, I, I think I've only shown you one trick, I think, to him, haven't I? Which was on he's the ground. Crazy, movie. he's crazy good. <laughs> like let's he's being modest but he's ridiculously good yeah. i've now seen three tricks that he's done in fact one i i sent an email to a lot of my friends um because i wanted to cut a, a little thing together from my my daughter's ninth birthday since she was completely socially isolated and couldn't see anyone um so nick very generously put on camera like did like he is looking right now he did a whole zoom magic trick for her wow which totally duped us i mean I, I don't know how i still don't know how he did it but anyway he's really good so if you had another 10 20 minutes i'm sure he'd, he'd be yeah. able to knock your socks off when are you yeah how'd you get on my list i work for the federal government my name is jackie kino nice uh you're the lady who's been asking questions about me. A fish cop. Monica Raymond is kicking butt and taking names as Jackie Quinones in the star series Hightown. I caught up with Monica to talk about the first season, her character's journey towards sobriety, and the news that Hightown is coming back for a second season. Watch. So first of all, before we get into it, I want to say congratulations because Hightown was picked up for season two. I know we're in a pandemic right now. Were you able to celebrate it all? Maybe get on a Zoom call? Talk to me about that. Yeah, absolutely. We were able, I was able to celebrate by connecting with my cast and the creator of the show, Rebecca Cutter. Um, it was such a huge, it was so exciting to hear that the fans love it and that we get to have another shot at telling the story and expanding the world. And what kind of storylines can fans expect for season two? Well, I haven't read any yet, but I do have a good idea. Um, we're gonna start to see the crime, the, um, like the drug crime ring sort of expand. We're gonna start to see it move from Provincetown into Hyannis and a little bit throughout Cape Cod, more into like the unknown cities. Um, we're gonna see some new characters who are taking over. And I think we're gonna start to see Jackie, my character, become more and more officially involved in um, taking down the bad guys. Yeah, and you know, watching this show, it's so cool you get to play this really tough character, Jackie. And what were your initial thoughts of her when you read the script for the first time? I was really intrigued by um, how messy she was and how imperfect, flawed, and dark. I wanted to explore, you know, how, kind of like these phases of life that all of us go through, sort of these messy, I don't know phases, who am I, what's my purpose? And like living in that sort of immaturity before we really start to sort of know who we are. Um, so when I read the script, I was just intrigued by like how she skirts the line of uh, light and darkness, who she is in private versus who she is in public. And also like tackling that issue of sobriety for her. Like, what does that look like? Is it just like this final arrival to sobriety or is it something that she has to deal with every day consciously? And that's a really interesting aspect of the whole thing. I mean, what did you do to get into the life and mind of an addict? Because that's very intense. It's very intense. Um, you know, I unfortunately have a lot of, have a lot of resources available based on some friends and acquaintances and family members, as I'm sure you know some people who are suffering from addiction. 
And that is a, it's a very common issue now in the United States. Um, and having resources like Rebecca Cutter and Gary Lennon behind it, who um, have their own story that they're public about in battling addiction. So I, I had a lot of support and a lot of information from that, um, just both from personal experiences and from the creators of the show. Yeah, and it's, it's very relatable to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people know you from Chicago Fire. Everyone loved you as Gabby Dawson. How is Jackie different than Gabby? She's extremely different. If you watch Gabby Dawson, you know that even though she's a bit of a ball buster and like she likes to break the rules sometimes, it's always for a good cause. It's because she believes what she's doing is right. And she's devoted to, um, you know, helping people and helping save people. Jackie, on the other hand, is like, I like to say that she's one of the people that Gabby Dawson would try to save and who would she would try to help, you know? <laughs> she's suffering from uh, alcoholism. She's making these decisions that land her like in a jail once, uh, waking up in somebody else's bed. So she doesn't have her act together. And that's a very different experience than people who see Gabby Dawson, who, who does have her act together. She knows who she is, she knows what she wants. She's doing this career, like when she wanted to become a mom, she committed to that. Um, and Jackie is somebody who's like, I don't know what I want. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> I'm just gonna do what feels good. So it, they're pretty polar opposite. It must be so fun for you to play such different characters, right? Oh, it's the best. I mean, it's like what makes our job so much fun, you know? It's like what it's taps into that childlike imagination that we have. And to stay at play is kind of the whole point why I'm doing this. As soon as this stops being fun, I'll quit. You know? yeah. <laughs> have you thought about that before? Like, as soon as it's not fun, you're going to quit, then what are you going to do? I'll never quit because it'll never stop being fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I say it, it's like, this is the most fun job in the world to be a storyteller, whether you're in front of the camera or behind the camera, like we're all getting, like we're so lucky to have careers, like telling these stories that are coming from somebody else's brain and like people wanna pay you for that. It's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, something about Jackie as well, she's part of the LGBTQIA community. So considering it was just Pride Month and there's also this major call for diversity in television and in film when it comes to gender, sexual orientation and in race. I mean, tell us how Jackie can be this role model for people. Yeah, I mean, what's so wonderful about Jackie um, in the world of P-Town, which is an LGBTQ mecca, is that we're seeing how inclusive this community is in Hightown. Um, who she's sleeping with, how she identifies, is uh, very normalized in this world. You know, a lot of times you see TV shows or movies where it's about that person's sexual identity and um, their orientation. And in this show, it's not about that. That is a part of who she is. And it's a part of it. It's a characteristic of who she is. But that's not what the show is centered about. And that for me is like a pretty tangible step towards progress, you know, where we can start to uh, normalize it in a way where now we can focus, uh, where that kind of acceptance and inclusivity is, is becoming a lot more common. Um, so like having, playing Jackie, who's like obviously very comfortable as a queer woman, she identifies as lesbian, it's incredible because we're starting to see, I'm queer, and so I'm starting to see characters who are like me, you know, who love like me, who look like me on screen, and that's very empowering. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. How do you think Jackie would be doing during the pandemic? Because it obviously takes a toll on a lot of people. No, yeah, it's especially difficult for people who might be suffering from any kind of um, impulse or addiction. You know, isolation is sort of the first step towards a relapse. So I think Jackie is probably, since she's so new in her sobriety, I think she would probably be drinking. <laughs> She'd probably be drinking a lot. But if she were able to stay sober, she might be like, I don't know outside walking on the beach, you know, and <laughs> trying to stay away from the bars and the sins of the, of the evening. Yeah, finale is coming up, really exciting. Are you gonna be able to watch with people on Zoom or what's your plan for that? I actually have a plan that might be forming. I'm excited, you'll have to follow me on Instagram. I will announce it in a few days. 
I will be watching the show um, Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm in here in Utah, so I'll be watching 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, and yeah, I'll be able to engage with fans. You'll just have to keep following me on Instagram and I'll make an announcement in a few days. Sounds good. And before we go, how have you been doing during the pandemic? How are you holding up? How are you passing the time? Any new hobbies? That's really sweet to ask. Um, I have been, well, <laughs> probably doing the same thing you've been doing. <laughs> like cooking and reading and trying not to have too much anxiety about what's happening in the world. I'm trying to be outside. I just got here to Utah and that's sort of the whole reason was to get outside of the home and be in nature and try to find some peace and solitude a little bit that I can find uh, within all of this chaos that's happening. Yeah, what's your biggest piece of advice for people out there that are kind of struggling during this time? Well, I, I you know, I, I very much am cautious about isolation because it is a very dangerous place for um, mental health um, and various other issues. But for me, you know, I can spiral when I'm alone, when I'm isolating and I feel like I don't have much of a purpose, right? Or if I'm not like moving towards something. So connection is a really big advice I give myself and for others is do what we can to be proactive to connect with, with other human beings. It is really important to kind of keep our minds and our heart um, functioning and working in a, in a, in a hopefully in a peaceful way. Um, so reach out, reach out to friends and family and um, connect. Yeah, it's so important. If you sound just like me. I can spiral if I'm by myself. So it's so important to connect with people and let people know if you're having a hard time, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Monica, thank you so much for talking with me and congrats again on season two. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. People's World's Cutest Rescue Dog Contest presented by the Pedigree brand is back for its third year to turn your adorable pooch into a star. So if you have the world's sweetest shelter pup or your adopted canine is just the best ever, upload a photo of your dog to People's Contest page and share how adopting your furry best friend changed your life and theirs. Rescue dogs of all shapes, sizes, ages, and barks. <laughs> nice are all welcome don't forget to give a shout out to the rescue organization that helped you find your pup the contest is accepting entries now until august 10th submissions will be narrowed down by people judges to 10 finalists then the winner will be chosen by celebrity judges including dancing with the stars carrie ananaba singer songwriter cassidy pope and good morning america's lara spencer the winner will receive a custom photo shoot, a feature in People Magazine and on People.com, a year supply of dog food from the Pedigree brand, and a $1,000 donation to the pet rescue organization of the winner's choice. Now, last year's winner was Casey, a Keyshawn who spent four years in a puppy mill before she was rescued and adopted by a loving family in New Jersey. She is now living life carefree as an adored pet. Love that. The world's cutest rescue dog will be revealed in September on ABC's Good Morning America. So don't wait. Sign your dog up today. It's going to be a beautiful wedding. Here you are, standing on the precipice of something so much bigger than anyone here. But always remember, you are not alone. I don't think that we met. I'm Sarah. Niles. Hi. Hi. Hulu's latest star-studded rom-com, Palm Springs, follows two wedding guests stuck in an endless time loop. People's West Coast reporter, Topher Gawk Roger, caught up with the movie's cast to talk all about working together and how they would deal with reliving the same day over and over again. Watch. Let's talk about working with Andy and Kristen. You know, I want to know from each of you, was it hard to keep a straight face during all of this? <laughs> Meredith, we'll start with you. Yeah, there was definitely some, he's such a funny guy, but he's also such a pro. When we had to do the scene where we're talking at the same time and he's completing my sentences, that was really hard to get through. Um, but but he's just such a funny guy. I'm such a fan of his. And Kristen is such an incredible actress. I didn't get to work with her that, that much, but after watching her performance in the movie, I was just, yeah, I have a girl crush on her now. I'm publicly stating 
<laughs> I have all the same sentiments. They are both, <laughs> I mean, yes, I always wanted to laugh, but at, I also just like love watching them at the same time. Like I think they're both incredible performers um, and they just bring such a genuine attitude to everything they do and I love it. Definitely hard to keep a straight face. Uh, this was, uh, Andy and I have worked together three times now and he's a pal and uh, just a great guy to, uh, to work with and hang out with. Uh, and Chris and I met for the first time and uh, uh, the, uh, the first thing that was immediately apparent was what a great team she and Andy had already become. And, uh, and I think audiences will see that in the finished product. Start off talking about how you guys kind of built a rapport between each other. Did you guys know each other at all ahead of time? We had had one meeting uh, at my production company. Kristen came in to meet with me and Becky Sloviter, who produced the movie. She was supposed to be like 45 minutes to an hour and we ended up talking for like three plus hours and yeah, dishing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know Andy before this. I knew of Andy, obviously, and I like love everything he does. I just like, we really, I, <laughs> you're like, come on. <laughs> I really lucked out. Like, I've just always, we've had like a really easy rapport and I think we have like a similar sense of humor and we like, like the same things. And he's like, a, you know, a delight to like, be around as well as to work with and act with. Oh, I guess. Let's say you were living in the movie. Camilla, we'll start with you. Would you just be like, okay, this is my reality. I'm gonna stick with it. Are you the one who's like, okay, I'm figuring out how to get back to reality as quickly as possible? I would definitely, like I would, I would just embrace it for a little bit, but then I would quickly start to lose my mind and be like, okay, let me figure this out. Cause I'm a problem solver. Like I don't know how to let things go. So I think eventually I would just be like working really hard. Like kind of how Kristen is in the movie when she's like doing all the research and doing the FaceTimes with the experts and blah, blah, blah. Like that would definitely be me. I think that's one of the things that the movie really has fun with investigating. And I'm trying to be careful and not spoil too much. But, you know, at a certain point, I mean, you, you kind of feel free to try pretty much anything. So let's let's leave it at that. I think I would do exactly like my own version of what they do in the movie. I would like fight tooth and nail and be like, this isn't my reality. I refuse to accept this. And then I would accept it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we would have like one week of craziness and then be like, I gotta get home. Yeah, you're gonna like give it a little bit of time. Topher also spoke with Andy Samberg and Camilla Mendez about their respective TV series, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Riverdale, and got the scoop on what the future holds for them. Take a look. Well, your Brooklyn Nine Nine co-star Terry Crews recently said some new episodes were scrapped just due to current events. Do you have any kind of update on that or anything you can add to that on what's going on with the show? Um, not really, like more than what he said. I think it was like yesterday. But yeah, I mean, we're we're taking a step back, and the writers are all rethinking how we're going to move forward, as well as the cast. We're all in touch um, and kind of discussing how do you make a comedy show <laughs> about police right now and if we can find a, a way to doing that that we all feel morally okay about. Um, and I, I know that we'll figure it out, but it's definitely a, a challenge, so we'll see how it goes. Now, Camila, I don't want to get into too much of the details of what I'm asking about here, but you recently just posted something supporting your Riverdale castmates. And I just want to know, you know, how important it is for you guys to have each other's backs as a cast. Totally. Um, I think beyond it, me having my back, having their backs as a cast, I think it's also just about, I mean, these are my friends. They're my, they've become my family over the years. Um, and I also, you know, more than even them putting being put in a situation where they're being accused of something um, that they never did, the fact that this person went out of their way to like potentially destroy these people's careers, but also destroy the integrity of the Me Too movement, um, just to make a point about how easily people believe things was was so distasteful and destructive. And I do want to know: Have you heard anything about production updates about when you guys might be able to return to work at all? If you are, I think in the next few months. Um, you know, I think Vancouver is looking a lot better than other places, so I think they're opening up quicker. So, I mean, hopefully, in the next few months, if everything's you know done properly. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Now, are, are the cast like group chats blowing up, trying to? figure it out or just like trying to keep some sort of communication going until you can work again? You know, I think we're 
we've all just kind of been like, all right, whenever it happens, it happens. And we've all just been hanging out and enjoying the time off until then. After her show, Carol's second act was canceled back in May, Patricia Heaton is starting fresh. In this week's issue of People, she's opening up about the loss of the show that she headlined and executive produced and how she's not wallowing in it. She tells us, quote, there are these little funerals you have to have for certain dreams because that's how you make way for new things. For her, those things include her ongoing work with World Vision, tackling the causes of global poverty and injustice. She's also producing and financing an independent film with her husband of nearly 30 years, David Hunt. The film was shut down just five days before filming ended because of COVID-19. But Heaton says, when everything is taken away from you, things become clearer. She adds that she's very good at facing disappointments and struggles, at letting go and moving forward. And she's doing just that with her new book. It's called Your Second Act. In an excerpt from the book, Heaton writes this, we used to look at a big change in life as a midlife crisis, but a second act is a reinvention that can happen at any age and at any time, whether because of circumstances or an awakening. She continues, just get out there and embrace your life. For more on Patricia Heaton and how she's kicking off her own second act, pick up a copy of People on Newsstands Friday. All right, coming up tomorrow, Randy Finoli is explaining how he helped one bride say yes to the dress during the coronavirus pandemic for a special new episode. Plus, we are chatting with Jamie Lynn Spears and the cast of Zoe 101 about their big reunion airing on All That this weekend. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye, guys.